Hello, and welcome to the second of the inflammatory bowel disease webinars in conjunction with the Royal College of General Practitioners and Crohn's and Colitis UK. Today, we're going to talk about flare pathways, uh, one of the subjects that um, GPs either love or, or hate. Um, so I'm Kevin Barrett, I'm the IBD lead clinical champion for the Spotlight Project. Uh, we have the other clinical champions, the regional champions um, up on the list again as well. So if you're in one of those areas of the UK, you can get in touch with them or in touch with us um, and we can help you uh, produce events and um, do talks, all those different bits and pieces as well. But the contact details for us will be on the Spotlight Project toolkit. So I'm talking about IBD standard, which sounds a bit weird, but it is all relevant to flare management as well. The IBD standards uh, were published in 2019. These were updated from previous set of standards um, from a few years prior to that as well. This is a multidisciplinary, multi-agency uh, set of guidance for patients with IBD that involves primary care, secondary care, all the rural colleges, dietitians, nurses, pediatricians, surgeons, huge range of organisations, including patients, um, as well. So primary care were involved with that, um, both from primary care site of gastroenterology and the Royal College of General Practitioners. So this, this is a, a way of actually getting everybody together to, to improve care for patients with IBD. And the reason we're talking about this actually is to say that this is a, a, a process that took a couple of years to get um, up and running, um, involved a very clear process for doing so, um, almost starting from scratch. We did use the previous set of guidance for it as well. But what this came up with um, a set of, set of standards um, for IBD services. Now, most of these aren't relevant to primary care. Um, there are seven in total. So you've got the IBD service itself, as in who's, who are members of that. And um, you've got pathways and pre-diagnosis. And we talked about pathways and, and care protecting in the previous webinar. And it talks about what happens for patients um, who are newly diagnosed, um, what happens to them involving care plans again as well. And then flare management is a separate subject all by itself as well. Again, including pathways, protocols, information, access back to secondary care again as well, advice and management and steroid care is up there. Um, and that's a particularly important part for us as, as GPs. Other sections include surgery, inpatient care, and then ongoing care again as well. And the bit in ongoing care um, includes a personalized care plan, which I'm gonna come on to later on. So when we started off the Spotlight Project survey, uh, we did a uh, Spotlight Project, we did a survey at the beginning um, and we asked GPs actually how confident are you in managing IBD? We know that lots of GPs are quite happy to diagnose and recognise and suspect IBD and do the, the right investigations as well. But a patient with established IBD, um, there's such a myriad, such a difference in, in patients in terms of how they present to us, the medication they're on, lots of it's controlled by secondary care, so the biologics, for example, they can be on quite complicated regimes. Um, many of them have had surgery, uh, there's a huge spectrum of, of, of patients out there. Um, and the prevalence is quite low, so maybe 1% of the population as well. So there are, you know, as GPs, we, we don't come across patients with complex IBD that often, so it can be a little bit scary for us. So only half of us are confident in actually managing or helping patients um, who come to us with flares. Um, so we talked before about, uh, about care plans and then in the standards about flare management, this particularly talks about patients um, once they've been diagnosed, once they're under care of secondary care, they should be given um, a set of pathways um, or a care plan themselves that says to them, what to do in case of having a flare, what to do with the medication, what to increase, what to stop, what to change, who to seek advice from. So the aim actually is that every patient should know exactly what to do if they think they might be having a flare. However, we know that not every patient is under secondary care. Um, and we know that patients will still come to see us um, and we know that patients will kind of still have those, those situations that don't quite fall into where they think as well. So we need some advice um, for what to do as GPs to help our patients. So what the Spotlight Project did is we looked around the UK um, and we looked for pathways that, that different units have produced. And for those of you who are watching the, the webinar rather than listen to the, the audio, um, there's a reasonably complicated pathway up here that Birmingham use. It's great. It has exactly the right things to do on there as well, about how to identify a flare and what to do. Um, but for us trying to go through that in our consultations with a patient sitting in front of us, it's not that easy to do. Um, Local to me in North London, uh, this is the one that they use, which is probably even more scary than the previous one as well. Uh, it's text based, um, trying to man trying to go through that in a 10 minute consultation with the patients, uh, particularly if you're not familiar with IBD and you don't use it on a day to day basis, uh, you know, isn't particularly helpful. So we thought, why don't we come up with our own? So we got a group together 
Uh, it's got patients involved from GPs and IBD specialists, uh, dietitians, um, uh, IBD pharmacists as well, and came up with their own flare pathways. And these have been endorsed by the Royal College of General Practitioners, by the British Society of Gastroenterology, and by the Primary Care Society of Gastroenterology. And again, they look complicated, and unfortunately, we couldn't get everything onto one page, um, but they're there. So these are designed for patients who have got uncomplicated, pre-diagnosed inflammatory bowel disease. They're not for patients um, who have not yet been diagnosed. So those patients are waiting their investigative tests um, or patients who are sick or complicated as well. And we're going to go through one of the pathways in a little bit more detail just to give you a flavour of, what, of what's going on. I'm not particularly expecting people to remember or to learn these off by, by heart, but to know that they're there. Um, they're published on um, a couple of different websites. The main one for us to go to is the Royal College of General Practitioners IBD toolkit at rcgp.org.uk slash IBD. Um, and for those that are interested, they're also on the IBD UK um, website, but they're identical pathways um, on both, both websites. So if we go through ulcerative colitis, um, because we're probably more likely to see that in primary care um, than Crohn's, and ulcerative colitis on the whole can be a little bit less complicated than, than Crohn's disease. The main thing to do with these is to think, is, is my patient sitting in front of me that says, I think I'm having a flare or I've got some different symptoms? Um, are they appropriate for this pathway? Um, so again, this pathway is not designed for young patients, so patients under, under 16, under 18. Um, they should all be under the care of the paediatric services as well. It's not designed for patients who've got stomas or fistulas um, or had surgery because they can get quite complicated with scarring um, and uh, a whole range of strictures and a whole range of different things that can happen as well. And it's not designed for patients on biologics. So um, the drugs like Humira, those sorts of things um, that the patients may be on. Those patients should definitely be under the care of an IBD specialist. If they're new patients, they need to be referred urgently to the IBD service as well. Um, next stage is to think, actually, is this a flare that's actually happening? Because lots of patients with osteocolitis and Crohn's disease, um, their symptoms vary um, on a day-to-day, week-to-week -to -week basis. And lots of patients talk about triggers and trigger foods um, and stress triggering things off again as well. Um, and the key for us as, as uh, GPs is to think, actually, is it really a flare? So is it an inflammatory process going on? Or is it a symptomatic flare? Because lots of patients with IBD get IBS type symptoms as well, bloating and wind and, and diarrhea as well. Um, so again, we need to actually try and get some, um, some fairly uh, objective evidence that the patient is actually having an inflammatory flare rather than a symptomatic um, flare. Um, so blood tests are definitely useful in this situation. Carapotectin can be done, and that's very, very useful because, again, that's probably the, the most accurate way of testing. Um, however, access to carapotectin can be quite limited. So particularly patients who might be over 40, for example, um, or paediatric patients, um, or uh, and actually just waiting for results to come back. So it can take two weeks or so to get a carapotectin result back. Um, some lucky areas have actually got access to near patient testing, carapotectin test, uh, testing kits. Um, and if you have one of those in your surgery, that's absolutely fantastic because you can just do a test there and then and get a result. But they're, they're quite rare. Um, so certainly do some blood. Um, obviously, make sure the patient isn't sick because acute severe colitis um, is always there. Uh, the, the, uh, the pathway includes things like the true and wits criteria for acute, acute severe colitis. Um, but generally, we need to think about sepsis, anemia, um, acute kidney injury, all those sorts of things that we'd normally think about as well. So if we think the patient's sick, um, they probably are sick and they need to have a discussion with secondary care as well. Um, but those criteria can be useful when you're having those discussions with the gastroenterologist because they may ask you uh, about certain things. It's worth, it's worth doing that. Um, patients with, with symptoms that come on quite rapidly uh, are often easier to think actually this patient looks sick. However, lots of patients with established inflammatory bowel disease, they can get quite sick quite slowly. Um, and it can be very, very hard for us to actually choose the point or decide at which point that they're becoming unwell. Um, patients with IBD are often used to having abdominal pain, used to diarrhea, used to frequency, used to urgency, um, and used to managing it on a day to day basis and still going to work and still doing their um, their day to day life. Um, however, then there comes a point where actually 
um, that close to the tipping point of becoming septic or anemic um, or um, you know, acute kidney injury as well. And actually those discussions of those patients can be quite hard. Um, so it can be useful to actually have a, an objective measure like the true love and wits criteria. Um, so pyrexia, tachycardia, um, anemia, those sorts of things as well to say, actually, I'm really worried about you. I, I'm worried that you're deteriorating and I would like you to be um, you know, have a discussion or be seen by, by secondary care as well. Um, so those, those discussions can be quite tricky for us to have as, as GPs. So assuming you've not got a patient who's sick, um, who's got symptoms of very obviously IBD and you've done their blood tests and you're wondering what to do with them as well. Um, the pathway then talks about what to do next. Um, again, going through this now is, is not going to be that useful, um, but the key really is trying to avoid steroids. Um, we know that steroid use can increase the likelihood um, of, uh, of death, um, does increase your mortality from IBD, um, it does in introduce the risk of side effects as well. So we all know how much um, side effects can affect mood and appetite and skin thinning and osteoporosis, um, a whole range of different conditions it can affect as well. So patients with osteocolitis, generally because their disease is limited to, to the left-hand side of the, of the bowel, sometimes it's a pancolitis as well, then topical therapies are quite useful for these patients. Um, so suppositories, enemas, um, liquid enemas, uh, they can be quite useful as well. And the five ASAs, um, they're probably the mainstay of treatment for, for most of these patients as well. Um, and you can use a combination of, of rectal medications plus oral medications as well. Um, most patients will know exactly what treatment they've been prescribed by secondary care um, and know what, what works for them. Um, the different brands all release their, their effective agent at different parts of the bowel as well. Um, so it's important to make sure we prescribe the right thing. Um, some of them are better prescribed by brand name rather than generically as well. Um, so it's worth having a look at the discharge summaries and listen to the patient and saying actually, this is what I need. And you end up with some patients who are on quite complicated combinations of suppositories and enemas and tablet therapy as well. You can also use topical steroid treatments too. Um, and again, there's a list of those uh, on the toolkit on, on the pathways up there as well. Um, the response to, to mesalazines to 5ASA is a little bit slower than to steroids. So again, you know, you need to explain to patients they may not get better quite as quickly as if they're given steroids. So it's always worth trying to check response treatment after two weeks. And again, we can do that in a number of ways. We can book them back in, we can send ourselves tasks. Um, we can give the patient responsibilities in some circumstances to contact us if they're not, not getting better. And again, always respond, always check they're responding to their treatments. Um, and if they're not getting better, that's when you may either move on to steroids or actually seek advice from secondary care. I think the key message with all of these of the pathways is actually to say, um, if you're not sure what's going on, phone the IBD, IBD nurse helpline because they're there to help us as GPs as well as patients. Don't be afraid to speak to the on-call gastroenterologist either as well. And these pathways are there for patients where we're not sure what's going on, we can't get hold of them. The IBD nurse uh, might be away or sick or on leave and might not get a response back um, for some time. They're there as a guide. They're not really meant for things that we should do, they're things that we could do. Um, so bear that in mind again as well. Um, Crohn's Clytus UK have got a fantastic resource on their website, um, which is the IBD nurse map. So it's always worth looking for that um, and you can put in your postcode and it tells you where your nearest IBD service is, the best way to contact them um, and the response times to expect from them. Um, some have phone lines, some have email addresses on it as well. So have a look at that, um, particularly if you're if you're local and working across different areas of the UK or, or new to an area, you don't know what's going on as well. Um, but the IBD team are there to help us as GPs. So don't feel that we're doing this on our own. Um, and that these pathways are there as a guide, as an aid for us um, to work alongside secondary care. So as I said before, um, all these things are available on, on the IBD toolkit, and that's meant to be our one-stop shop uh, to help us diagnose and support and manage and help our patients with IBD as well. Uh, and don't forget about the fantastic charities that are out there to help our patients as well. So thank you very much.